Does anything change in terms of your returners with Caleb going on IR and there being fewer running backs now? Put the best 11 out there so we can win that down. That's all that matters. I just wasn't sure if like, Avery was maybe got a big role in the offense and that might. We, we try to, as a team, special teams are staying in the present. So that's a play on offense. It's actually the first play on offense when it comes to if you're talking about the return game or special teams. If you look at fourth down, if a team is going for it on fourth down, we, most teams call it got to have the situations. On special teams, it's a got to have a situation. Every fourth down play is a situational play. And it's our job as coaches and as an organization, as a team, to put the best 11 out there so we can win that down. Avery's uh, fair catch ritual where he sort of mimics a few after he does it, is that something that he came here with? Is that a coaching point from you? Or is that just a habit? That's just a habit. Those are things that he's been working on way before I started working with them. And you talk about the returners, you talk about punt return to kickoff return. The main thing is you want to catch the ball within the framework of your body. If you start catching that ball outside the framework of your body, you're more susceptible to having, uh, more prone to having balls like fumbles and muff punts. So. We, we talk about keeping your nose underneath the ball. Those are things that we work on. And we just want to be clean with our catch. Because it doesn't matter how dy dynamic you are as a returner, Josh, but if you can't have the proper catch mechanics, then that goes out the window if you can't catch the ball. So those are things that he's always been working on. And it's funny that it's just now showing up that people are paying attention to that because he's been doing that since wow. he's been a rookie. His first day in the building, he's been doing it at Boise State as well. With the weathers uh, anticipated to be so cold, I think the, the wind chill is supposed to be like seven degrees at kickoff. Does that affect the way that you prepare or kind of scheme up special teams at all? Or anything I mean, you can do to prepare for it? I mean, the weather's real. I think all of our players have all played in some type of cold conditions from the top of our roster to the bottom of our roster, quarterback all the way down to D-line. Um, those are things that we always prepare for. That's why it's awesome that we get the opportunity to practice outside. I know it's not going to be as cold, but those conditions are real. It does change how the, the feel of the ball is, the surface that you're playing on, and more so how the ball travels in the air. So those are things that we work on, and we try to use that to our advantage. I remember back when we were talking about rain. I forget which game it was. I guess it was the Carolina. Carolina. Yeah. So do you do anything? specific when it comes to this? Like, do you, like, put balls in, like, a cryo chamber for, like, 10 minutes to freeze them or something like that? Or? I was thinking about the meat freezer in the cafeteria, <laughs> putting the ball in there. Yeah. No. No. We just go out there and practice, you know. Uh, the thing is, there's different, like, the quarterback ball is different than the K ball. I don't know if you guys know that. We have we get three K balls a game. So those are the balls that we operate with, and those balls kind of are different than actual quarterback football. But we don't necessarily make a ball colder or anything like that. What are the rules for how those balls are treated? I mean, can you keep them right by the heater? Is there a rule about that? I'm not sure about that. I know there's a, a person on the sideline that carries those balls, but you, I've never seen that, keeping the ball by the heater. I know we had a situation last year, somebody was by the heater and their jacket melted, so you probably don't want the football to melt. You know, you like that, Tori? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, young way, like when he's warming up, will he kind of communicate with you like what he feels like his range is for a given game based on the conditions that he's facing, whether it's wind or rain or cold or whatever it is? Oh, yeah, those are conversations that we have every day and particularly on game day. Every NFL game, if you guys go to like pregame when those guys are out there warming up, those that's one of the main focuses is if we're playing in an outdoor environment or even if it's an indoor environment based on how that kicker and punter is feeling, those are, they allow them to go through their process, get warmed up. They get opportunity to get a chance to fill out the surface, the various conditions, wind, rain, snow, footing, all those different things, the balls that they're hitting. And those are communications, the conversations that we have as a specialist group. And then those conversations I have with the specialist, I have with the head coach. And then the head coach, myself, and the specialist, we make sure we're all on the same page. And that comes into the game planning within the game, within that happens within the next hour or so. So those are continual conversations that we have from now all the way throughout the uh, before kickoff and even throughout the game, and that helps our head coach have a clear mind and be decisive with his decision making. Uh, you, you talked about Mike Ford some last week. What about uh, Hodge on the other side? He's another guy that seems to take a lot of pride in special teams. And can those guys provide energy? It seems like they're so enthusiastic about their job. Like, how does Hodge kind of help you, especially? 
you know, Hodge has been a, a great addition to our, our, our team and our special teams unit. Um, he's made a name for himself as a special teams player. If you look back at when he played initially, when he played for um, the Los Angeles Rams, and then he played, he really made an impact when he was with the Cleveland Browns as a special teams player. So I've always admired his career from afar. And then it's a blessing to have him on our team because a receiver that could play at defensive positions and go down and cover kicks. He's right now leading our team in solo tackles on special teams, and that's from the receiver receiver room, which is a blessing. And now he's not the only guy that could tackle every day. If you guys come to watch our practice, you know, during the field goal period, which will be tomorrow or even yesterday, during field goals, those offensive skill guys, that's what they work on. You know, I know as a coach, we can't put guys in positions if we don't provide them with the tools, Scott, when it comes to playing special teams. And that's something Hodge takes pride in playing on special teams because he knows that down is important. And that's where that energy comes from, those guys being in the present and knowing how much they can help the team. And the only way you can help the team is by doing your job at the highest level. So he's been doing a great job, and we're very happy to have him here. How, how did you evaluate Desmond's first start? Yeah, I think when you go into it, regardless if it's you know first or whatever start it would be in terms of totality, you're looking at things not just physical, right? You want to see how – uh, certain quarterbacks or individuals handle the environment. So going in there on the road, how do you handle situational football? Um, any pre-snap issues? Are the play calls clean? Like the, the mental side of the game, you know, again, I think you can look at a ticker, you can look at a stat line, I got that. Okay, a lot of stories can be told on how certain guys get to certain statistics. But the game within the game of the quarterback spot is obviously getting your chance to get everybody on the same page operating in a certain manner, uh, which allows the other guys to play at least the best of their ability by giving them a chance in the huddle and after the huddle's broken, post-snap, what your decision's making, not just in the pass game, run game. So there's things of that nature, right, that you're, you're equipping him with during the week. You want to see how he handles those. There's things that he did really well in those situations, handle out of the environment. And then obviously post-snap, you're going to things that are your controllables, right, your eyes and your feet. Are you taking the right drop? Are your eyes in the right spot? Then, right, now the uncontrollable, once that ball leaves your hand, right, is that decision that you made within less than three seconds, is that the right decision? And again, you know, the, the great thing about coaching is you have a clicker and you can stop the film and you can just evaluate and judge and everything else in real time, and that quarterback's making decisions in real, real time, which is less than three. And that's the life they signed up for. Uh, when you play the position. So there's things to grow from, there's things to learn from, but there's things in which he handled for his first start. I've been around a number of rookie quarterbacks, including myself, um, and I thought he did a really, really good job of the parts that aren't seen in terms of when the ball's thrown. And again, you're constantly looking for signs of maturation. You're constantly looking at signs of improvement. And second week now, there's things now that are, are on his plate uh, to be able to handle in another great environment. Um, I've had the luxury of bringing a rookie quarterback, I guess, against Coach Pease in 2017 in this exact same situation into Baltimore. Um, so they're a great fan base. They've got a phenomenal defense. They've had a great structure built in terms of their foundation of their organization. Um, and Des is up for another challenge, and we have to prepare him that way. And um, it'll, be, it'll be great for not just him, but the other 10 guys in the huddle with him. I know you were around. <coughs> what was going through your head when you saw what happened at Dean on Sunday? Yeah, I mean, I was, I didn't see it. I was down by the, um, I think, down by the centers at that point. Um, and I obviously saw a commotion. And there was people circling around and people running. So I knew something wasn't uh, necessarily great. Uh, walked over. I didn't get close enough um, really to see who it was until I was told. Um, uh, given the doctors and everybody else the room to work. Um, a lot of things go through your head. And first and foremost is, you know, you're making sure that, you know, you hope everything's all right. And not knowing all the details of what occurred or how it happened. And uh, known, I've known Dean a long time. And so that was, it was personal, like for all of us. Um, I mean, you're just, you know, we're just fortunate um, that he's all right. Tyler Algier, the way he runs, how does that fit to really what you guys 
maybe look for in the back? Yeah, I think when through the evaluation process, either in college or free agency, there's a certain type of intent, um, vision, patience. And every carry that Tyler gets, Tyler gets better. Um, that goes for a lot of our young players on offense. You know, at one point, I think I looked out there, we had just handed the ball off to Algier from a rookie quarterback. The next play we threw to a rookie wide receiver in Drake, right? So no excuses. Those are great learning opportunities. And us as coaches, right, we have to put those guys in the best position um, where the experience in the NFL is not going to be high because they're rookies, right? We have to make sure that we put them in a, in a situation where they can ultimately tilt towards being successful. And you see it with all the young guys that we have out there. Uh, they have a chance to play for us, and uh, no different than Algier. I think he goes about it the right way. You look, again, I think the easiest thing to do is just look at stats and stuff like that and just associate with good or not good or whatever. But the chance to be in the building like we are as coaches with those players and seeing them evolve from when they got here, when we drafted them, to where they are today in, in mid-December, um, you grow an appreciation for how they go about as professionals because they're learning how to be a professional, and they take the right approach. They're guided by veterans, and um, they're fast learners. So that's all you can ask for. On that note, uh, when it comes to uh, Drake specifically, how have you seen him kind of grow and evolve? He was talking about improving on the mental side of the game. I don't know if you've seen Yeah, that. sure. I think it's one of those things where, you know, you go into it and, and you want to see how he adapts to certain looks that he gets. You know, we try to, as you can see, right, we move him around. Um, and his ability to grasp space, obviously, was one of the things that attracted us to him. Um, and his ability to make the tough catch, right? It's hard to get guys wide, wide open in the National Football League. Um, you want guys who are fearless, who understand space, and um, you can trust. And he's shown in times of critical situations those. And you, you hope he continues, and we hope we're able to put them, him in that situation. And not just not him, it's just the other guys at the receiving spot or tight end spot. Um, you're looking for those signs, and you're looking for um, them to be tested, which we have been. And you want to see how they, um, how they go about that. And uh, so far, you know, from the mental side to the physical side, he's learning each day. Out in the practice field, there would be something new. You're playing against a great, great secondary here where he's going to be faced with a different sort of challenge than he was last week. Um, and you're just trying to prepare those guys for, for what's potentially ahead. Thank you. Going back to Desmond real quick, when he comes out very amped in that first drive and maybe even into the second drive, do you have to go over and, and talk to him and be like, hey, patience, calm down, breathe, all that kind of stuff? Or is he able to kind of do that on his own in himself? Yeah, I think when – right, you, you go through a game with anybody, especially the first time, you can talk about it all you want in the in the meeting rooms of how to react and how to respond. Um, not until you go through it do you actually know what those emotions are like, right? So, for instance, for him or any young player, but for him in general, like going out there, the fact that he was aggressive on the first play um, is what a mentality that he's had since college. We're not going to steer away from that. Um, again, if you go out there with the the thought process of just keep it safe and check it down and all that. Well, the defense is going to know that, right? And they're all of a sudden going to play you a lot different than they – I'm not sure. Again, we didn't complete the ball. I understand that. But to come out with the first play of a rookie quarterback and go ahead and feel free to take a shot, it does send a little bit of, okay, we're going to play. And Des was – he saw an opportunity. He took an opportunity to take that shot. Um, didn't work out. But it's – that's the one thing I have learned about quarterback play. It's a lot easier to pull someone back who's aggressive than make someone who's conservative aggressive. And there is a risk meter in your head that goes off. Right? Every quarterback has it since the age they started playing it to the NFL. Right? Within three seconds, you're assessing risk. And that risk is, can I take that shot? Where are my eyes? Can I make that throw? And what type of ball am I putting out there? And within that time frame, you have to make that assessment. What's hard to do is when the guy is – not by nature, and there's been tons of great quarterbacks who have not by nature been aggressive and had long careers. But then all of a sudden when you're trying to force an outcome of, hey, we can push it, no, let's go ahead and extend the ball down. The, that's just not necessarily how some quarterbacks are wired. And so they don't see the space the same way. The quarterbacks that have the mentality to see space down the field with be able to push it doesn't mean you're always successful. It's a lot easier to say, hey, if you start to feel a lot of bodies start to go deep, 
you know, those check downs are starting to open up bigger and bigger. And so for him, going through the first game, right, you're going through all those things. When he comes off the sideline, he's exactly what I thought he would be. Um, he understood what he saw out there. He's very good with the dialogue. Uh, the conversations we have, we have the luxury of having the pitchers. He's going off real-time memory, and it was pretty good recollection. And so that's what you're looking for from the quarterback spot. Can he give you information quickly, and can it be right? And um, that's also part of the evaluation process, you know, as you get to know the player. In that evaluation process, did you see any of yourself in this one? Oh, I hope not. <laughs> right? <laughs> Golly. Absolutely Look, not I not want not. this kid to have the opposite of my career. So thanks for the Christmas spirit on that question. <laughs> no, I know what you're I, I, Yeah, sure. I think that's where it probably stops. I mean, he's – look, what you want, regardless of who is coaching him or not, what he – what attracted you to him in the, in the draft process was he played a ton of games in college and he was successful and he took a program um, that had never gone somewhere and he was part of, right, with other players, part of the reason why they were able to do what they were able to do. That's confidence. Right. And that's what attracts you to certain quarterbacks is their ability to how they carry themselves. And it's not fake. It's authentic. And you want to see that regardless of the outcome that happens on that play. And we saw it in preseason. We saw it in practice. Um, we saw it during the game. And this is a tough position in sports. Right. You go from all of a sudden, you know, scout team, scout team, scout team. And oh, by the way, let's go ahead in December. Let's go. And let's go to New Orleans. Let's go to Baltimore. Right, let's go play ball. And you got to have a certain kind of mindset and a certain type of um, inner confidence to go out and as a rookie or regardless of years of experience and, and go play quarterback in the National Football League, right? Because you're constantly judged within a time frame of three or four seconds. And you have to have a certain mindset in order to play the position. And being around the position for my time, certain guys who come in the league with a certain mindset sometimes don't leave this league with the same mindset. And what I mean by that is all of a sudden confidence starts to get knocked when things don't go your way. The guys who survive in this league and have great careers are the ones who are able to fight through it all, understand exactly who they are as a player, constantly try to get better, and they're unwavered by anything outside. And so you can program a guy all you want, and you can tell him that, and I can give a great speech. But the reality is a lot of it comes from the inside and how you're wired. And that's the whole process. And again, putting Des out there in these situations, it's not just an evaluation of is he, we're trying to win football games, right? That's why he's out there. So it's all part of the process. He's out there, he needs to make plays, guys around him plays, and we're trying to win. We're still trying to score points, we're trying to move the ball, we're trying to be good on third down, red zone, all those things are still, it's part of the job description, regardless of years of experience or not. The goal is to score points. The goal is to try to put yourself, your team, your offense, in the best position to go win football games at the end. You have preached to him, I know. You, you can't prepare for your moment when it arrives. You've got to be preparing for it, and then when it arrives, whenever it arrives. How, you know, so when it finally got here, did you feel like he had done the work in the first yeah. 13 weeks that he should have been doing? Yeah, that's a good question. I think you go through the process of practice, right? That's where it starts. And what you see is you want to see his ability for – his command in the huddle, how he gets the line of scrimmage, how he functions, can he fix pieces, can he get everything going, can we play with tempo, right? And those are the things that you're trying to make sure you're prepared for. Because the last thing you want to have happen is you break that huddle, and now all of a sudden you're in a little bit of a daze, the clock's run on you, and instead of playing the defense, you're playing the play clock. And at least my experience with quarterbacks, the guys who play the play clock and just worried about getting that ball off, they typically don't have a lot of success. The guys who are in control of the play clock, understand the time, are in control, usually, right, there's things that are gonna work out their way. And so that's what we're trying to program him right now, right? Understand the situations, understand the play clock, play with tempo, play with speed, communicate. There's a lot more things in, in playing quarterback than just being able to complete the ball, especially at this level. And it's all part of the process and we're all here to try to help him get there as fast as possible, and I know that's his goal as well. It looked like uh, you both made your first start in game 14. Did that connection, Don? And look at you doing that. <laughs> sure work. My goodness. Do not look at that stat line from my side. I think I might have been the leading rusher at that point. Um, yeah, look, I didn't think of it that way. Um, I just wondered if you had... No, I buried that thing. So I'm glad you keep bringing up the Christmas past here <laughs> and all this, but no, that, that was gone. That, great. People are going to try to YouTube that and go, oh, my goodness. How are they using their veteran uh, pass rushers? Well, I mean, they're using 
Look, played against both, have a ton of respect. I mean, these guys are obviously in this league for a long, re long time for a reason. You know, when I haven't, you know, been around this playing Baltimore really five, six years, and the respect I had back in 17 hasn't changed in 22. But the defense is really good in situational football for a reason. Um, they're good in for, and what they do well, the reason why they're so good on third down is on first and second down, they put you in third down negative situations for the offense. And they truly believe what they do, and you can see with the violence and physicality and the speed in which they play, that uh, they believe they can get you in third down. And once they get you in third down, and they got, they have really, really good football football players at every level. You know what they made the the move for Roquan. Obviously, my experience with him, um, I saw him coming as a rookie, and then you see him now. Um, obviously, only that's gotten. The only thing that's made him better is experience, and I thought he was good as a rookie. Um, so he'll be a challenge just like everybody else um, at, that, at all three levels of that defense. And um, w we expect this to be one of our best challenges of the year. We understand offensively what we're facing. The, the right side of your offensive line, Chris and Caleb, have been working together for a long time, second year in the system. How have you seen them kind of grow? And are they in the type of sync that you would expect for guys that have played thousands of snaps? Yeah, I think that's a good question. I think what you see from all of them, right? I know the right side, but all of them. And again, we've been, because of their issues at left guard because of injury, um, give nothing but credit to the O-line coaches uh, and their ability to get the next guy up to ready to play. Uh, but you're seeing a, a group that's in sync. You're seeing a group that believes in each other and that can communicate. And they know each other's weaknesses. They know each other's strengths. And they believe in the coaching. And you see them play fast. It's the same thing I described to you guys as a defense. Every time I talk about defense, right? Do you let them like, they play fast. When they play fast, they're well coached. Like, you can see it. It's the same way I feel about the guys up front. They play extremely fast. Um, their tempo in and out of the huddle and when the ball snapped is what they pride themselves on. Um, when you put the film on, you can see it. Hey, walk us through what happened last Sunday. Uh, I was just uh, standing there on the field in pregame and talking to, uh, I think it's Christina. Pink, and we're just having a good conversation, and uh, all of a sudden, I got hit. So I just didn't see it coming. I don't think anybody saw it coming. Uh, he didn't see me, obviously, and and uh, didn't mean to do it. And I just and I, I, normally I'm out there. I'm kind of very cognizant of you know punts going on and quarterbacks throwing and guys warming up and stuff. But uh, didn't see that one, and just got hit from the side and went down. Just at a point, like, were you aware of what was going on? Or? Uh, if I was out, it was very for a very, very short time. I, I don't think I was ever totally out. Uh, just remember hitting the ground and um, just kind of looking up, going, what the hell just happened? And uh, good question. the good thing was the doctor asked me um, where I was, and as I'm looking up, you know, they, they – they print Superdome on the top there. So, so it was good because I looked up and I go, okay, it's Superdome. <laughs> so, so the good thing was I had a good answer for him. Uh, so, uh, you know, and then he just asked me a bunch of questions and stuff. And um, so that, that was kind of it. I tried to tell him to, that I thought I could go and just let me get up and walk around. Um, and part of the reason that they, they – just to give you a – a reason um, that they told me I had to go to the hospital was because the, one of our team doctors or whoever was there n knows that I'm on blood thinners. And because I'm on blood thinners, if there's any bleeding in the brain, that can be very serious, can lead to a stroke. The, they said you could even uh, not know that it's bleeding. The only way you can do that is through a CAT scan. And so that was that was why they would not let me get up and go because I kept telling them I, I think I'm good enough I, I'm, I'm feel beat up a little bit but I don't feel like I'm you know um, concussed or anything like that and uh, so but then they said no because of that um, they weren't and they just took the precautionary measures of putting the stuff on my neck and all that kind of stuff which always looks terrible but you know it's, it's precautionary but that's why they took me to the hospital was because I had to have a CAT scan, and it was all because of the blood thinner medicine that I'm on. So other than that, because I think if I had not been on that, they, they might have let me at least hang around and see how things were, but they didn't. So, I mean, when did you realize you were okay and, like, going to be okay? 
I didn't, didn't uh, other than the fact that, you know, he had me a little concerned about the blood thinner myself once he told me that, <laughs> uh, I didn't really, you know, I didn't really think about it. I mean, I know I bruise sometimes a little different because of that. Um, but so then when he said that, it was kind of like, oh, okay. So, uh, but I never really felt like I was other than sore and just like <laughs> beat, beat up a little bit. Um, I felt okay in the hospital. They did a great job. People there in New Orleans at the hospital did a great job. Um, and then when he finally came in and, and told me that the CAT scan was clean, that there was nothing, and my wife says she could have told him that there was nothing up there too. <laughs> so, so, so it, I said, see, she just should ask her. So um, th 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 then I knew I was, I was okay. So then I kept going, just let me get out of here. And uh, but by that time, by, by the time they did all the tests and got everything back, there was I got back to the training room there at the the uh, um, stadium just as uh, Rashawn was getting the sack right there down by the by the end zone which was a good thing so I thought so I got to actually sit in the training room in the dark on it to watch a TV you know I, I thought we were gonna pull it off so I sat there for about the last well, I don't know what was it maybe six minutes ago in a game or something or five minutes ago in a game last five minutes or so so I was there at the stadium then at that time you have some, some experienced and respected defensive coaches on your staff how do you feel like they kind of oh did, did a great right? did a great job and I think that's that's um, I'm not surprised um, Frank called a great game I thought our guys played great hey we gave up an explosive and that caused it really that's that's that was it I mean it was not statistically or whatever point wise we gave up a 60 yarder you know it's it's you just can't do that but other than that I thought the guys played well I thought they played to the run well uh, they're a good running team uh, Hills the guy, the guy averaged like 6.8 yards a carry going into the game. I don't know what he got in the game, but I know we didn't give up some of the ones like the 50-yarder we gave up to him in the first game. And so uh, – and, and all the coaches, not just Frank. Frank called a good game. I'm telling you, Ted could have called it. John could have called it. Gary – I mean, they're all, they all did a great job. Uh, Matt, Patrick, Lanier, Nick, all, everybody pitched in to, did a great – I thought it did a great job. The guys played hard. And when I watched the film uh, – I was very proud of them, all of them, the team and and especially the coaching staff. And that's that's a tribute to guys paying attention as a position coach or whatever to what the game plan is and why we call things and why we do things the way we do. And that's why you can go in and and call the game. They also, if you look at those guys, they've all at some point in time been defensive coordinators at some level or whatever, a little bit, whether it's been a long time or not. So calling a game um, isn't really – I mean, it isn't like the first time, okay, I've never, ever done this. Frank's done it before. Ted was coordinator in Indianapolis. Uh, you know, John was coordinator in college. So they've called games. And even during uh, preseason, like when we're out here in practice in training camp, you know, we'll have two teams going at the same time. Well, somebody's over there calling the defense. I'm not calling them both. So, uh, I, like I said, I can't say enough about them. They, did, they, did, they all did a great job, all of them. How – Familiar does the current Baltimore defense look to you? I know you probably don't really look at it much, but if you, you watch the <coughs> I don't. They, you know, sometimes they ask me some questions and stuff, and it, it's stuff that we did. I think, you know, it's like anything else. You know, Mike was with me uh, there. Uh, Mike McDonald was, was an assistant linebacker coach, and, and uh, of course, then he went to Michigan and came back. And I used to, even when I watched the Michigan, when we watched them play, I could see the stuff that we did at, at Baltimore. But like any defensive coordinator, he's going to put his own – stamp on it, going to put his own wrinkles on it. There's things they do that, yeah, that's what we did. And then there's other things, no, we we never did that. So it, it's like anybody, uh, he's going to have some, it's like stuff that, I mean, I took stuff from Bill, I took stuff from everybody I've worked with, or, you know, I've taken stuff from them to form my own. So, yeah, there's going to be things that they'll, you know, I'm sure if Belichick watches the film, goes, yeah, we did that at New England, or John watches it, yeah, we did that at Baltimore, or whatever. Uh, but he's still going to put his own stamp on it. And everybody calls the game different, too. Some guys are more aggressive. Some guys are less aggressive. Some guys like more man coverage. Some guys don't. It's all going to change, too, basically, on the personnel that you have. So there, there's, 
there's similarities, but I still feel like it's it's his defense. Coach uh, Frank Bush talked about Troy Anderson like trending for a very long time. What have you seen from him up to this point in his rookie season? Well, I think he's, he has been trending, and he's been getting better and better, and that's why he's gotten more time and gotten more playing time because he's he's earned it and uh, has nothing to do with, with uh, Michael or anybody else not doing the job. It's really just sometimes if this guy's doing a little better, we're going to play the guy that's doing a little better. It doesn't really mean that the other guy's not doing well. It just means that that guy might be just doing a little bit better. Uh, I'm not dissatisfied with Michael Walker either in any way. Kind of going back to Baltimore, is this your, you've been back a lot, right? Or no? Is this uh, well, I was back in the playoffs in 2019. <laughs> that was a memorable. <laughs> that was a memorable, memorable occasion. But other than that, that's the only time I've. Uh, that's the only time I've been back. Well, I, I, I'll say this about Baltimore: I have the utmost respect, and I loved it there. Uh, I have nothing but good feelings about Baltimore. Uh, it's a great football town. Fans are very avid. Uh, they love their defense, uh, always have. And uh, Coach Harbaugh, like I told you, he played for me in college, and I coached for him for eight years. I retired from there. Uh, I really thought I was going to stay retired, too. I did not retire with the thought of going somewhere else. And so, I mean, it, it's, it was a very, very good place for me. I loved my eight years there. The staff – the administrative part of it, Ozzy, Steve Bashotti, the owner, all of them. I, I have no, uh, like I say, I left there on really, really great terms and, and had a great eight-year run there. And so uh, no, I have nothing negative. I, I, I really like my time there. And, um, just to be clear, you're good to coach and travel and everything. Yes, specific. yes. When you go into a league with some uncertainty with the opposing quarterback, does that, what does that do to the preparation in terms of whether you see Lamar? Or well, it's kind of, it's, it seems like in this league lately that's the case all the time because every quarterback is getting hurt. Uh, they are. I mean, it's just it's been crazy uh, who some of the quarterbacks have been. And um, it's just you just got to prepare more for the coordinator maybe than you do the actual quarterback. I mean, um, you know, it's just, but at the same time, you, you got to prepare like it's going to be Lamar and you got to prepare like it's not. So, you know, it's just, it's, there's certain plays that are never going to change. They're staples. They're going to show up no matter who the quarterback is. You got to make sure you got those handled. And then it's just a matter of what style of quarterback they have. Well, if you look at all their quarterbacks, they're the same style of quarterback. It's not like I told you that one time I went from Michael Vick to Matt Schaub. I mean, that, that's, there's a, there's a distinct difference there. So their, their three guys are, are very similar, so they can do the same stuff.